So continuing our series, A Closer Walk With Thee. It says, two men were traveling down the road together when a bear appeared out of nowhere. Before the bear could spot them, one guy ran for a tree at the, site, at the side of the road, climbed into the branches and hid. The other man, who wasn't as nimble as his tree climbing companion, threw himself on the ground and pretended to be dead. The bear came up, sniffed all around him, and appeared to whisper something in his ear. The man always heard that bears won't touch a dead body, so he lay perfectly still and held his breath. Sure enough, the bear took him for a corpse and left. When the coast was clear, the guy in the tree came down curious. He asked his buddy what the bear had whispered when it, when it put his mouth directly to his ear. He replied, he told me never to travel with a friend who deserts you at the first sight of danger. You know, in this world that we live in, we see danger all around. Amen? But should we get discouraged? Should we go and hide like his friend does? You know, God ain't put us here to be or to live in fear. Amen? And if we're supposed to be that friend that sticks closer than a brother, then we definitely can't go and hide at the first sight of danger, right? And so today we're going to learn about uh, a devout man who, who stood up for what's right, who, who stood in the gap as an encourager. Acts chapter 4. Verse 34, it says, Now was there anyone among them who lacked? For all who were, were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as ever anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Faith should be accompanied by actions, and that was the testimony of Barnabas. He was the model of what it means to be generous and to help those in need. Through the life of Barnabas, we can gain insight into the power of faith, generosity, and selflessness. Amen? Is that a life that you model? Faith, generosity, selflessness? Joseph was known for being generous with more than material things. He was also generous with encouragement. That they, that's why they called him Barnabas the son of encouragement. What would it look like if somebody was to name the service that you provide? Would somebody call you the son of encouragement or, or the, son, the son of hope, the son of kindness? You know, what, what would your name be and, and what you provide to others? So we'll take a road down uh, Barnabas being a good neighbor. We, we read in, um, in many scriptures, it, it tells us the first and the second greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor. Amen? And so in loving our neighbor, what neighbor are we? So in Acts chapter 9, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus, 
in the name of Jesus. You know, Barnabas extended the love of Jesus to Saul. And as Paul wrote later in his letters, that love believes all things. Amen? So we, we can't just count everybody out. Amen? Because we do, not, we do not know what heart the Lord will move on. Amen? And especially if God prompt any one of our hearts to go and share the gospel with somebody. We should never be discouraged about sharing the gospel with nobody. Because it is that gospel that saved you, amen? So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but, the, but, the attempt, but they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. You know, not only did he bring him to the disciples and pleaded with him that this man was part of the Lord, he stuck with Paul throughout many journeys. And, and that's another thing with us being a child of God, children of God, in the family of God. We can't just preach the gospel to somebody and, and they get saved around us and we do nothing else. Because that new soul needs your soul. That new soul, that new convert Need to hear what? More about the gospel. He need what? A whole lot of encouragement. A lot of encouragement. Especially in this world that we live in. Where church is talked down about. The word of God just stand outside. We need encouragement. So in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 38 it said you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but I tell you not to resist an evil person but whoever slaps you on the right cheek turn the other to him also hmm don't sound pretty fitting for nobody right not even a Christian right for somebody to slap you on your cheek and you turn around and let them slap you on the other one? To us who reading it from this, it may sound uh, something that we not really preferable with. But back in those days, a, a slap on the cheek was considered as an a, a insult. You know, and, and, and Jesus saying that, you know, if, if somebody insulted you, ain't no need for you to take retaliation. As he does say, what? Well, vengeance is mine. Huh? And when you do turn that right, that other cheek and, and let them insult you again, knowing that it also says, to be kind. Because in your kindness, it shall what? Cause burning coals on his head. Something in his spirit going to resonate that I'm trying to insult you, but you're trying to be kind to me. Something don't sit right with this. Something going to say that he got something going on that I don't know about. Is that the kind of neighbor you are? See, in being a neighbor, you could be that one that, that just come out the house and you know, wave and tell them, how you doing? Have a good day. Or you can be that neighbor who sees somebody in the yard doing something, and you go over there and give them a hand. Or you could be that neighbor who, whenever they come out, you slam your door because you don't want to have nothing to do with them. But what part of Christ 
is that showing to the other? Like Jesus said with, uh, which I'm going to get to later, when he spoke about the Good Samaritan. And he asked, which of these three was a neighbor? If he was to ask you, which three are you a neighbor? What would your response be? Continuing in verse 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We was talking about prayer this morning in Sabbath school. But how many of us is actually lifting up our enemies? How many of us is actually praying for that person that despitefully use you? You know, we can pray for better times in this world. But are we praying for a change of heart? Are we praying that the Lord will move? Or are we praying that things just get fixed in the manner that we want? It says that you may be sons of the Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If we sanctify, how are we going to do the same? If we sanctify, how are we going to behave the same? We are children of God. Greater is he that is in you than he is who is in the world. And for that fact, I don't behave like the world. It says, and if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do, to do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Does not God set an example for us to follow in his son, Jesus Christ? Did he not give us the things to follow and do as he did? That's what makes ones perfect. Not counting flaws or what you didn't do. It's more about completely walking in the grace and the fullness of Jesus Christ. Amen? Acts 11. It said, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Amen. A ministry can't turn people to the Lord unless the hand of the Lord is with them. You can turn people to many things without the hand of the Lord. You can turn people to social clubs without the hand of the Lord. And you can turn people to a church or an institution without the hand of the Lord. But you can't turn people to the Lord without the hand of the Lord. Amen. And it said, and the hand of the Lord was with them. It's the hand of the Lord with you. Because when he is, it says a great number believe and turn to the Lord. Many of us pray for, as we said earlier, for family members and loved ones to turn to the Lord. But it's the hand of the Lord on you. It goes on to say, then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. 
when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people added to the Lord. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged. Do we even see the grace of God these days? Yes, Lord. The Bible says, "Was sin abound more the grace. So we may see sin, but grace is there. Because if grace wasn't there, this whole world would be destroyed. And so we should be glad and encouraged when we see the grace of God. And not only that, others should see the grace of God in us. Amen? Everywhere we go, we should manifest the grace of God. Wasn't it that grace that saved you? Huh? By faith, you were saved through grace? And if that grace saved you, that grace should what? Go everywhere you go. That grace gave you life. And in your life, you walk by that grace. So in Luke chapter 10, we read about a gentleman wanting to justify himself. He says, who is my neighbor? So Jesus told the story of the Jewish traveler who was robbed, beaten, and left to die on Jericho Road. Two of the Jews, both in the ministry, walked past him without helping. The Samaritan rescued him. No race of people was more hated by the Jewish people than Samaritans. What the Samaritan does is nothing less than fruitful. He utilizes all his resources personal clothing, oil, wine, his time, his animal, money, and energy to attend to this Jewish man in the best way possible. Then he risks his life by taking the wounded man to a lodging in a Jewish area. And on top of it all, he pays the innkeeper for the man's food and room for many days and promises to return and pay for anything more the man owes. This was crucial because anyone who could not pay their bill could be sold as a slave by the innkeeper, so the debt would be satisfied in full payment. So which of these do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? No law will ever cause you to be a good neighbor, but the love of Christ will. A neighbor is not identified by color or creed. A neighbor is identified by the nearest need. Amen? I heard a, I heard a saying that said uh, the richest man in, in, in a room is not the one who is wealthy. He is the one who is less in need. It's all about how we perceive things. But being a good neighbor is one who extends encouragement, kindness, your energy, your resources. Because if you have faith in God, you know that anything that you feel that you lose, he will restore a hundredfold. The Christian that has the full love of God will never lack. Amen? Acts 13. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them 
persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Man, the grace of God is so powerful that it can have people asking for the word of God. Continuing in grace is as important as beginning in grace. Amen? That grace that first prompted you to be on your journey with Christ should be that same grace that's continuing in your life now. It says on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blasphemy. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. See, they, they, they might have lived in a small community in that time so the whole city could come. But I believe that when the grace of God is amongst his children, that it will draw many, right? Because Christ said, if, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Are we lifting Christ up in our circles? Are we lifting Christ up in everybody that we encounter? You know, we don't have to throw a Bible at everybody, but they should know that the grace of God is amongst you. Amen? Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Not everybody you share the gospel with going to be receptive, amen? But long as they know that I'm giving you this in love. I'm giving you this in truth. And I'm giving you this by the Spirit of God. When you want to tell others about Jesus, we ought to begin with our own group our family or our friends or even our coworkers. And sometimes it's not really receptive, right? You invite them to church. You know, you tell them about the Lord. But we are all judged. We are all left to make that decision ourselves. Amen? And so are they. But as long as we do it in love, I believe that we're doing it unto the Father. Amen? For so the Lord was commanded, has commanded us, I have set you a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. We have to know that wherever God calls us to, that's where we go. Whomever he calls us to, that's who we go to. And verse 48 says, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God, of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And that's what we should have and believe in our spirit. That everybody who is appointed to eternal life will be saved. Amen. We just got to continue in the word of God. Acts 14, verse 21, it says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lustrous, Iconium, and Antioch. Now, Paul and Barnabas wanted to do far more than gain conversion. They had a compassion to make disciples. Amen? Do we have that same compassion? If Matthew 28 says, go into all nations and make many disciples, are we discipling others? Or do we just care about a conversion? 
a number. Discipleship is what? It's a follower of Christ. It's one who what? Who studies and preaches and walk in the commandments of God. A disciple is one who actually truly follow everything Christ does and says. And I believe that's what we should all want for one another. Amen? Because in reality, in a family, you want that same thing with your brothers and sisters. Amen? You want them to achieve the best, you know, growing up. You want them to run and do the same things. And so we in the family of God. We are children of God. And if we disciples of God, we would surely want others to be disciples as well. Amen? We want them to call him the same Abba Father as we do. So verse 22 says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Many Christians need strengthening in their souls. Amen. I need strengthening as well. Amen. I need encouragement as well. Many need exhorting to continue in their faith. That's why many are falling off now as Christians. It's not enough encouragement. It's not enough walking daily with one another. It's no small thing to walk with the Lord year after year, trial after trial. It takes a strong soul and an encouraged faith. And we should preach that message because we live that message of tribulation. Amen? What you've been through, somebody may not have actually went through it, but you know they went through something. And so when you can preach that, hey, I went through this through the grace of God. I went through this with the love of God. You can encourage and then strengthen them to take that continuous step. Because you can tell them that I didn't give up. You don't have to give up. I persevered. You can persevere. You know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes stated that to everything there is a season. And he named 28 different times, but none of them included a time to quit. Walking closer with God is a journey of perseverance and endurance, no matter what we face or encounter. And we can't quit. We can't turn back or look back. Because the kingdom of God is what? forward. Paul says what? I'm pressing forward and reaching. You can't. That would be very awkward to reach backwards, right? And I don't think you can gain many things or even pull many things if you're reaching backwards because you have to turn around. So we reach forward, we press forward. Lastly, in Matthew 25, in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. It says, I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous were answering him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry 
and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The most profound thing about that is they was doing it and not knowing it. Huh? They was doing it because it was their nature. It, they was doing it because of the love that was in them. They wasn't doing it for a prize. And that's what Barnabas teaches us. He didn't do it to gain a reward. He didn't do it to, be, to gain any acclamation from the other disciples. Or, he just did it because that's who he was. And that's the thing we're living as a child of God and being full of grace. You begin to do it because it's what's inside of you. Amen? Because if Christ and God came to abide in you, then what they preach, what they speak, what they teach, how they love should be manifested through you. Amen? Because Christ said he died that he may live through us. And Christ is the greatest encourager. And so with that same spirit that he gave Barnabas, he should have gave to us if we shall receive. Amen? And always remember your ABCs. Always remember your ABCs. Always be caring. Amen? Let us stand. Like Barnabas, as Christians, we are called to be encouragers, particularly of those who are weak in the faith or struggling. As Acts eleven twenty three, 23, Barnabas, as a man who was delighted to see others inhibiting the grace of God in their lives, exhorting and encouraging them to remain faithful. In the same way, we should look for opportunities to praise those who bring glory and honor to God through their lives that reflect their faith. In addition, Barnabas is, is an example of a generous spirit when it comes to giving sacrificially to the work of the Lord. And as I said, what kind of neighbor are you? Let that be your prayer today. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your life. We thank you for this example of Barnabas, Lord, whom you gave the spirit of encouragement, whom you gave the spirit to, of protection, Lord. You gave him a spirit of love. And his faith manifested the grace of God. His life manifested Christ and so Lord I pray that we would be that neighbor Lord who when we see somebody in need we go and help we extend our kindness we extend our resources and our efforts because everything that we say and do is always to, the, always to the glory of God. And for that, God, we thank you and we praise you. And may you continue to strengthen us, Lord, on this journey towards the kingdom. And may you continue to bless our efforts. 
And if there's anything that we lack, we pray, God, that you will strengthen us. That you will supply every need. That we can continue to do what's pleasing in your sight. So, Father, we thank you, God, we praise you. In Jesus' mighty holy name, amen. amen. Let us recite Psalm 1914. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, God bless you. Happy Sabbath.